before we begin today, we would like to acknowledge the tr traditional custodians of the lands across Australia we are meeting upon and pay our respects to Elders past and present. My name's Tamara Swan and this is Avina Trasinski. We are both researchers at the Australian Indigenous Health Infonet and have worked on our recent eye health projects in partnership with the Fred Hollows Foundation. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We are pleased to introduce our guest presenters, both affiliates of the Fred Hollows Foundation, Dr. Chris Rala Baker, who has become quite renowned as Australia's first Indigenous ophthalmologist, and Dr. Madeline Adams, an ophthalmologist who has also worked extensively with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia. Both Chris and Madeline are joining us from Queensland today, and I'll allow them to introduce themselves further shortly. The theme for today's webinar is eye screening and care, and our guest presenters will be discussing aspects of eye screening for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, such as treatment pathways and the various professional roles involved in eye screening and eye care. We will have about 10 to 15 minutes after the presentation for Q&A, but please feel free to send any questions or comments through that come up for you during the presentation using the chat facility, and I will save these for the Q&A at the end. It is worth noting that Chris recently assisted us with the development of a short animated video and key fact sheets about eye screening, and we'll share the links to these at the end of the webinar. I'll also let you know that the webinar is being recorded and will become available on Health Infonet shortly, just in case you missed something or would like to share this with your other colleagues. I'm now going to switch over to Chris and Madeline for the presentation. Okay. Hi there. Um, so I just spoke to Chris and he actually has an emergency, so he's going to be joining us shortly. So um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Madeline Adams. Chris and I work together in, in Queensland and also um, in Caloundra and in uh, regional Queensland as well. And we've both um, worked in Central Australia together and also both worked in Perth together. So we seem to be working as a team quite a lot. So it's appropriate that we're presenting this together. Um, Chris and I trained together in Queensland. That's our sort of graduation, looking very proud of ourselves. Um, and we're both ophthalmologists. Um, yeah. So today we just wanted to give a little bit um, of an overview of um, the Australian eye health system. I hope we're not teaching anyone to suck eggs, but we're going to keep it reasonably basic. Um, but of course, happy to answer any questions that arise as we go along. So first of all, um, in terms of uh, the issue of screening in Australia, uh, there is a big country. Uh, we don't really have a, a, a national health service like other countries do, So, in which, which can make screening slightly harder um, to implement. We also have different uh, systems uh, and different standards of, of eye care really uh, depending on the region that people live in and, and that's because of uh, issues in terms of barriers of access to care just to do with geographic location uh, and also to do with um, socioeconomic issues um, and often language problems so they can exist both in urban and rural and remote and they will have as everyone I'm sure that's listening and understands they will have their own issues to address so also, of course, the the funding differs um, from uh, state to state, uh, and we have not just uh, so federal Medicare funding. We also have state-based services, and then we have uh, non-governmental organisations like Fred Hollows, the Ideas Van, the Lions Advoc Van, um, who also assist in the implementation of, of screening and other eye health programmes. So today we're also going to just talk through the different roles uh, that patients may meet as part of both the screening process, but also uh, that work in eye health more generally. So uh, this is not a hierarchy of seniority, but just uh, to explain a bit how it works, the, there are only 800 ophthalmologists approximately in Australia. So clearly everybody in Australia who has an eye issue will not be able to be seen by an ophthalmologist. So the point of, um, uh, of screening is to work out who needs to be seen by an ophthalmologist. So ophthalmologists are responsible for intervention. So that is both uh, medical and surgical intervention in eye health. 
optometrists who we work closely with also are responsible for intervention uh, but their intervention uh, is to do with refraction that is um, glasses uh, we don't dispense glasses ophthalmologists optometrists do and also many optometrists also um, have undergone therapeutics training and they are able to dispense a limited range of medications as well. General practitioners generally, um, although they are vital uh, in supporting screening programs themselves, uh, obviously have, there's a spectrum of interest and um, experience in eyes, but GPs themselves uh, uh, are um, not uh, have limited um, ophthalmic trainings. Um, true for most ophthalmic doctors, to be honest, because they can't be expert at everything. Um, but they, uh, in GP practices, there are cameras to photograph, and they will screen people that have high risk of eye diseases. But they will then normally pass on to an optometrist. To see an ophthalmologist, uh, it requires uh, a referral from either an optometrist or a GP. So health workers also play a, a pivotal role in screening, um, often uh, or most of the time working alongside GPs, but also sometimes in mobile eye health units such as the Ideas Van or the Lions Outback Van. And then the last category of eye care professionals or optists, these tend to work uh, closely with ophthalmologists generally within clinics or hospitals. Uh, and they provide um, clinical support. They tend to be the experts in the technical side of, of imaging to support the clinic, and also they screen independently and pass on to ophthalmologists. So, so when we're talking about screening, we just thought we'd just recap what that actually means and, and what is the point of screening. So, screening, according to the WHO, is uh, is pretty much what, what this, you can see the definition on the screen, but it's about working out uh, from a large population who's at risk of having a disease, uh, identifying those individuals, and then allowing them to access intervention. So, um, and at each stage of this process, of course, it's up to the patient whether they choose to participate, uh, at, at to have tests, to receive treatment uh, or advice, or even just support. So, in the UK, where there is a national health service, uh, they have implemented diabetic eye disease screening uh, to significant effect. Prior to them implementing national screening, diabetic eye disease was a leading cause of irreversible visual loss in working age adults. And that is no longer the case. Now the leading cause is inherited eye disease. So uh, it indicates that if we can get screening right, it's, it's of primary importance. In the last year, we have uh, initiate, well, I'm going to say we, I mean more broadly Australia has initiated uh, um, the Keep Sight program which is intending to move us towards having a national diabetic eye screening program uh, and this is aimed for all eye health professionals to, to register uh, and then conduct eye checks, record these visits and then the patients themselves will get reminders on their phones or through email to prompt them to come back at the required interval according to their disease level. And also uh, diabetes health professionals um, can also register and then they can refer on um, through that system for patients to receive eye health checks. And so we do have some uh, so local screening programs already in place. Uh, the Ideas Van in Queensland and Victoria, obviously the other WA Lions Outback Van, VOS in the Northern Territory and the Brian Holden Institute. And they will work collaboratively with uh, state and federal programs uh, to improve access to eye health. Eye health care. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're just going to talk about each of those people on that chart a little bit uh, and their role here. So, um, so even though Australia, obviously Australia uh, globally is well placed in terms of eye health overall, uh, there are still some groups who um, and some areas where the the standard of eye care is lower, um, and um, we are moving to try and improve this, uh, particularly for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders to close the gap. Where even though that is closing, which is heartening, that uh, that has gone in the last 20 years from from 10 times more likely to have irreversible blindness to three times more likely, um, there's still much work to be done. Um, health workers working in the communities are um, 
often are the ones on the ground uh, responsible for uh, taking the photographs with the cameras and some diabetic screening uh, that also involved in trachoma programs. So for, we were going to talk about the pathways for each of those. So if I'm talking to lots of health workers, you already know this, but obviously there are multiple avenues um, to, in, to become a health worker. So some will, and it depends again on, on, on the state and the region, so some health workers will train on the job and some um, will uh, train elsewhere and obtain a formal certificate and then can continue with further training on the job. So and health workers often will work more generally, not just in eyes, and then will be specifically working. For instance, we have uh, Fiona in Alice Springs Hospital who just works in the eye department um, and, the, and there are others. Um, and then others will work, of course, in, in non-eye specialties. So an optometrist, um, so my optometrist in the practice just told me that uh, the, the last part of the slide is incorrect because now apparently it's all a master's or a doctorate to become an optometrist. So it's a relatively long training uh, in terms of undergrad, they do six years at university uh, and they are eye care professionals and their area of expertise uh, is a, a, a refractive um, I guess, so basically diagnosing people who need to wear glasses to improve the vision. Refractive error is the largest cause of uh, visual impairment in Australia. So a, a large number of people who require glasses to be able to see well uh, do, do not have and do not have access to, to achieve those. So um, improving uh, the coverage of optometrists uh, in rural and remote areas is a relatively low hanging fruit in, in, in improving people's um, vision. So yes, yeah, so they train uh, predominantly in, um, uh, there's the QUT in Queensland, there's, and there's Melbourne and Sydney, and it's a four to six year master's or doctorate. So an orthoptist also uh, is eye specific, and they do either four years uh, as a primary degree, as a master's, or they can do another science-based degree and then do two years of a master of orthoptics as a postgrad. Um, they are particular experts in eye disorders, so with children with what we call strabismus or squints, um, but they also uh, are, tend to be highly skilled in the technical side of imaging and assisting ophthalmologists in their clinic. So uh, GPs, I think um, everybody's happy with what a GP is. A GP is a, is a general practitioner. They probably have the hardest role because they have to be across everything. Uh, they do a medical degree and then a minimum of four years graduate training. There's two colleges uh, that train GPs, the College of Rural and Remote and also the Royal College of General Practitioners. Uh, and as I said before, although they're vital in the role of eye health, um, they have, they're not specific to eyes because they have to be across all specialties to some degree. Uh, and then we have the ophthalmologist, which is Chris and myself. So um, we do uh, six years as an undergrad, and then the, probably the, the typical length of training after that would be between 10 and 15 years. And that we often would do um, some general non ophthalmic junior uh, doctor roles, and then you get into a training program. And then after you've finished your basic training program, uh, then you, you typically do fellowships in a subspecialty. Uh, and often that's undertaken overseas. So, so one point of confusion for patients uh, and, and who can blame them because our names are very similar uh, is that they often think they're an optometrist when they're seeing us or vice versa. And so just it, the, the easiest way really is to say that ophthalmologists are just eye doctors and it's perhaps easier to use that term, um, whereas um, optometrists, they're, they're the primary degree is in, is in optics um, and therefore we don't give out glasses and they don't do surgery really is our, probably the easiest way to explain that. So um, so we're not going to talk a lot about refractive error because even though we manage that um, surgically that's uh, that's really the optometrist domain but it is important to remember that refractive error is uh, the most important cause of visual impairment and that it is relatively easily treated and inexpensively uh, with the administration of, of, of spectacles. So in terms of 
uh, diabetes. So we're going to talk about the areas that have been focused on uh, in the Fred Hollows plan, and um, which are a diabetes, trachoma, cataract, and we won't talk so much about refractive error. So first of all, just in terms of the diabetic eye. So there are some sort of key um, figures to remember about diabetes and key points. And one that we'd like to make is that, although we're going to talk now a lot about diabetic retinopathy, um, that diabetes increases the risk of blindness by 20 times. And that isn't all about diabetic retinopathy. Diabetics are a high risk of, of having strokes. They're a high risk of having ocular surface disorders. Uh, and for instance, neuropathy, which can mean they can have non-healing um, ulcers on their eye. Uh, the complications of diabetes can, can cause them to have uh, glaucoma, rubiotic glaucoma, and also they're more likely to have uh, primary open angle glaucoma. So that glaucoma is when the pressure is raised in the eye and that is uh, causes a deleterious effect on the optic nerve, which takes the signals to the brain from the eye. And so being a diabetic increases uh, your risk of glaucoma. That's another of irreversible blindness. So, or often can have shifting refractive error, which makes it difficult for them to be able to see because the requirement for glasses is changing all the time. They get cataracts earlier, and cataracts in diabetics can be a problem because it's more difficult to follow the disease which is occurring at the back of their eye. Uh, and also they can have other, other than diabetic retinopathy, they're more likely to have blocked vessels at the back of the eye, which can also cause visual loss and require treatment. And uh, when they have strokes not, uh, that, that can affect the eye movement as well, so they can end up experiencing double vision. So uh, diabetes is, is bad news, or certainly uncontrolled by uh, diabetes is bad news for the eye, and so we need to be um, watching these patients carefully. So diabetic retinopathy and maculopathy are, present the biggest threats to vision. So, and we'll show you some pictures in a minute to explain a little bit more what we're talking about here. Uh, retin retinopathy occurs because the vessels in diabetics are diseased. And so the eyes are the only part of the body where you can see that in action. So we, we know that diabetics can have peripheral vascular disease and, and can have issues um, with loss of sensation in their legs and uh, poor vascular supply to, to the peripheries. But in the eyes, we can actually see the diseased vessels. And so these diseased vessels mean that the eye, which has a very high metabolic rate, isn't getting the oxygen and the nutrients it needs. And that causes it to produce uh, chemicals which are called budget, which can cause abnormal new vessels to grow and you can have problems with uh, bleeding and leakage and we'll show you some pictures in a second but this disease diabetic retinopathy actually has a uh, presents a, a real risk of severe visual loss and by severe visual loss that means that if you could read the bottom of an eye chart you would be moved up to the top of the of the eye chart um, and I, you would no longer be able to drive and and, and function is difficult uh, so that risk is about 40 percent in a year if if you have the first type of the retinopathy, which is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So as ophthalmologists, we want to avoid people ever getting to that stage. But we want to try um, and spot fire and reduce that from happening um, and control their risk factors. So in terms of uh, maculopathy, the maculopathy is when the macula or the centre of the vision uh, develop swelling and that's again to do with the chemicals that are released because of compromised blood supply to the eye and that also uh, can cause visual loss and, um, and because it's the center of the vision patients tend to be quite symptomatic. The issue with retinopathy is patients are often not symptomatic in, until they are end stage disease um, and whereas maculopathy even though it affects because it affects the center patients tend to notice things earlier on. But both of these things can be treated effectively. So we should not be going blind from diabetes in Australia because we should now be able to prevent it. In particular, for um, so we know that in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, of those that have diabetes, 40% will have some type of diabetic retinopathy and 10% have vision threatening diabetic retinopathy. So the risk, the risk factors for developing diabetic retinopathy or maculopathy or indeed any diabetic related eye disease, the biggest one is duration. Uh, so the more you have diabetes, the more likely you are to have diabetic related complications. And that, that is not a modifiable risk factor, unfortunately. 
um, for control is. So, so control of diabetes is really important, and we'll talk about that more in a risk factor. Smoking makes diabetic complications much more severe, and they tend to happen earlier. And pregnancy also increases the risk of having diabetic-related uh, complications, not just uh, to the eye, but to the whole body. So in terms of screening, so for, for effective screening, a, a disease has to be reasonably common, so that diabetes is, and also there has to be um, some intervention uh, which is effective. And so we have that. So di diabetes and diabetic eye disease meets criteria uh, for screening. And so we have a National Health and Medical Research Council guidelines on when we should start screening people with diabetes. So part of that is there's no point screening a population where the, the proportion that will have disease will be very, very low. So we know that with type 1 diabetics, so that's the type of diabetes that develops in childhood. Um, it's a sudden onset. Uh, so they go from well, relatively having have normal sugar control to abnormal sugar control. So they don't have, uh, because the duration is the biggest cause of having diabetic retinopathy myopathy, they don't have any diabetic eye disease a presentation, so there's no point seeing them when they're first diagnosed. Whereas type 2 diabetics, which tend to be the, more likely to be the, the middle-aged diabetics, um, they often will have had disease for a long time before it's actually diagnosed. And so we know that on diagnosis, one in three type 2 diabetics already have diabetic eye disease. So after 15 years of having diabetic retinopathy, 90% of type 1s, so even though we don't see them to start with, uh, 15 years later, almost all of them are going to have a degree of diabetic retinopathy. And then for type 2, uh, some patients end up requiring insulin for their control and in that group they behave quite similar to type 1s. So most of them will also develop some type of retinopathy, so 90% of 15 years. If, if they have better control and, and don't require insulin, uh, then, um, then that figure is about 50%. But each year, 5 to 10 will progress from having no disease to having retinopathy. So that means that we need to watch diabetics, i.e. we need to screen them. So when should we screen? So for type 1, we don't start screening until five years after they've been diagnosed. Uh, for type 2, we screen immediately. And then the NHMRC guidelines are for two yearly screening, uh, except for um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders screening. I, my uh, perspective on this would be uh, that I think, so when we talk about screening, we're saying that they should either have photographs taken or they should attend an optometrist. As I said before, we all know that uh, diabetics have a higher risk of a number of different eye conditions, in, including glaucoma, um, and many people would recommend that those above 40 should attend an doctor once a year for glaucoma screening. So ideally, I, I tend to tell my patients to see an optometrist once a year. Also, uh, the advantage of that is people tend to remember a yearly visit, uh, whereas remembering a two-year visit, people are less, I find they're less likely to remember. So that's a good thing about the Keep Sight program is that when your patients are registered for that, they will get uh, a, an SMS to remind them that they need an eye health check if they're still at the screening shade stage. And that will be either with an optometrist or with a health worker for a photograph. So these are uh, this is one of the cameras. So there are two main cameras across Australia which have been installed for photographic screening for diabetes, the DRS and the CR2. I think we have more DRS in Queensland, and of course each has its, its own pros and cons. Um, they are reasonably easy to use, they both have some skill, and so there's some training uh, when they're implemented. The, the issue of course with screening is that you can take the pictures but somebody needs to look, with, look at them and then grade them to decide what stage of, of retinopathy they have, and that also uh, differs at the moment uh, from region to region. So we, we're just going to talk a little bit about what we talk about, what we mean by the different stages of retinopathy. So the, the mild one we can see on the screen there, to be counted as a, a mild diabetic retinopathy, they are only allowed to have microaneurysms. And that's microaneurysms are where, when the vessel uh, the wall is unhealthy and you get these little outpouchings, um, the tiny little red dots on the photographs. So if they have a couple of tiny little red dots and nothing else, then they're classified as mild. The reason 
one of the reasons, well, the main reason that we need to know what stage they are is the stage determines their risk of going on to develop site-threatening disease. So if you've got mild disease, you only have about a 1% a year chance of going on to get the proliferative type. A few slides back, when I was talking about proliferative disease, saying that, of course, proliferative is important because then they have a 40% chance of severe visual loss in a year. So if they have mild disease, we're not too worried. They can um, remain in the community and be screened uh, once a year or once every two years. So for moderate disease, they basically have the, a little bit more than mild. They will have a couple of ridges around the place, but they won't be in all four quadrants or all four sectors of the eye. You may see, and so for hemorrhages, they look slightly bigger red dots on the, on, on the photographs. They'll probably have more microaneurysms. And sometimes, I mean, so the exudates are more to do with myelopathy. These photos, by the way, are from the International Council of Ophthalmology, um, official sort of screening photos so they're really accessible on, on the web and it's a good document to read anyway um, about diabetic disease. So when once you have moderate eye disease your risk of developing side disease is about three percent a year or, or up to five, three to five percent a year so the moderates tend to um, be seen by an ophthalmologist once a year at this point. So severe disease is when we all get a little bit edgy about it. Um, Severe have four quadrants of um, images. Uh, they also can have. There's a strict definition. They have other. Vas they can have something called erma or beading. Uh, and they're basically again just specific signs on the uh, on the photographs. And the the ICO PDF has some examples of what they look like. So the issue with severe disease is is that they have about a 50% chance of going on to develop proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and then you can see the, the final photograph of the proliferative. Um, so this patient's obviously had a little bit of laser as well, which is what some like dots are, but there's abnormal vessels which have grown because of the, so much of this chemical VEGF being pumped out. Uh, there's um, the more hemorrhages around the place, and you can see that the architecture of, of the eye is beginning to look um, ab quite abnormal. Okay, so that's basically the grading. So in diabetic macular edema, although you can um, get a sense of, of it being there when you look at a photo, it's best detected using an OCT. An OCT uh, takes a cross-sectional image of the macula. Uh, generally, these exist in uh, an optometrist uh, or in a hospital eye clinic. So if a diabetic has, um, what well, a diabetic that has a visual loss should be assessed basically by an optometrist and or an ophthalmologist. Um, and an OCT would form part of that exam. So, so overall, what should we be telling our diabetic patients and why? So we go on and on about control of diabetes, but from our perspective as eye specialists, we know that if we can get diabetics to control their blood sugar really, really tightly and really well, below 7% HbA1c in the, in the old school terminology, or now we call it 53 millimoles a mole, they reduce their risk of developing it in the first place by 75, approximately 75%, which is huge. Um, and if they all it, then we can reduce the progression by about 50%. And similarly, if they can control their blood pressure very tightly, that is below 130 over 80, then the risk of progression is reduced by about 50%. So these are kind of big figures. They're not saying, oh, you'll reduce it by a little bit. It's okay, we'll make a big difference to their chance of developing side threatening disease. Obviously, we'd like them to stop smoking. Um, we will send on a type 2 diabetics to the GP to be given a script for a drug mm. called phenofibrate which has been shown in uh, big trials to slow the progression of the also. Um, and the other, th other point we just like to flag is that pre pregnancy is a nightmare for um, ophthalmologists with diabetic patients, um, and they need to be watched very closely during this time because the eye disease can progress much more quickly. And so really, uh, um, individuals who are planning uh, to become pregnant should see their ophthalmologist, if, if they have diabetic eye disease, should see their ophthalmologist during the planning stage, and then they should be seen regularly during the pregnancy, and then for the, for the risk, the heightened risk of, of progressive disease um, persists for about 18 months after the pregnancy. And so just quickly on the treatments for um, 
diabetes, we have uh, so we've had laser for a long time now. We still use it for proliferative disease. That works by basically um, killing Hof, which is a horrible way of putting it, but the retina, which is very sick and not working well anyway in the periphery, and that's producing the chemical, which is wreaking all the havoc. Um, so for a long time, that was our only treatment. Now we tend to have lighter ligaments um, combined with injections into the eye, and we eject a drug which directly inhibits a VEGF chemical, so they are anti-VEGF uh, drugs, and there's, a, there's basically three that we use, and they're all much of a muchness, really, um, and that bottom middle photo just, is just a schematic of, of where we're injecting into the eye. So the issue, I suppose, with these injections is, is in the context of diabetes, that we generally like to give a loading dose uh, of, um, of monthly injections for three, and then we try and send them out. But for patients where there's use um, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, can be difficult. Moving on, I can't go to my next slide. Okay. That's right. Okay, so um, this was going to be talking about trachoma. So these, um, so uh, so trachoma obviously is um, of great um, uh, health and political importance in Australia. So we are the only. Um, wealthy Western country uh, that still has trachoma. So active trachoma, that is the, so trachoma is, um, is transmitted by a fly, it exists mainly in hot and dusty environments, which of course is central Australia, and trachoma now of, of course own, um, is found basically in Aboriginal children, mainly in central Australia. And so, uh, and fatalities have been instrumental in, in working uh, towards eliminating trachoma in Australia. So the WHO talk about um, the safe approach to trachoma and, and when you read safe we read back to front because that the, the first thing is addressing the environment um, so uh, individuals that live in overcrowded environments um, are more likely to develop it. Uh, it's important that there is good uh, both hand and, and um, face hygiene. When when individuals have active trachoma, they need to be treated with antibiotics, but not just those individuals, but the whole community, uh, because otherwise it will just be retransmitted back into the affected individuals. Uh, and then for the later stages of disease, which we try and avoid people getting to, then there are head surgeries that we perform. So even though the active conjunctivitis is found in children, um, predominantly in, in um, central Australia, the later stage of the disease can be found anywhere in Australia because obviously people don't necessarily stay in the same place. And um, so we, um, it's something that we need to actively look for in people with ocular surface disease. So it starts off as a, as a, 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 a nasty um, conjunctivitis. It, it predominantly affects the upper lid. So these funny pictures are basically when we've obviously affected the upper lid. Uh, in the later stages, you get this what we call subtarsal scarring, so the lid isn't sitting right on the eye, and eventually the lid can turn in on itself and starts to scratch the surface of the eye with the eyelashes. Obviously, that's not good, and uh, if that continues for a long time, you start to get scarring on the surface of the eye, and that can lead to blindness. So, lastly, so uh, cataracts, which, of course, when, we, when we're talking about cataracts, we're talking about cloudy lenses. Um, and again, this is an important cause um, of visual impairment in, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Not often it goes uh, missed until people have fairly late disease, but that can happen in, in, in um, any section of Australian society. And, and cataracts are probably, are, are, well, are the most commonly performed operation, uh, ophthalmic operation in Australia. Interritual injections, which we mentioned before for diabetes, are now the most commonly performed ophthalmic procedure. Australia. So, um, so cataract surgery um, is, is the answer to cataracts. So it's, there is no medical treatment for the clouding of the lens at this point. Um, and the surgery that we perform basically involves, you can see that in the top schematic is just showing the, the cloudy lens. So we um, make tiny little cuts in the front of the eye. We go in with 
a uh, which is like a Barbie vacuum cleaner is what it looks like, um, which is an ultrasound machine, and we break up the cataract into pieces, and then we remove it, relieve the capsule or the bag that the cataract sits in in place, and then instead of the cloudy cataract, we replace it with an artificial lens, which is a small little disc of plastic. So basically, I don't know if you do in the video, but uh, this this is like a lot like a large version of one, and so they're foldy and they we can fold them and inject them so we can make tiny little wounds in the eye. So 30 years ago, um, the, there were large wounds made and it was a much more um, invasive procedure, but now most people recover within days rather than weeks and most people see better again the same day or within days. So um, it's a very satisfying operation as, as a surgeon because uh, it has very high success rates. Um, and can really transform transforms people's lives. So I was going to show you actually what an actual eye well, but the I don't know if you can see it on there, but they're, they're super tiny. They we do measurements of the eye to to um, maximise the visual outcome afterwards. So uh, each person will require a slightly different strength of lens, uh, depending on how long the eye is and the cornea. So we take measurements beforehand, we choose the most appropriate lens, and that's the one that we put into the patient's eye. So, so cataract blindness is reversible blindness um, and, um, and it re requires reasonably straightforward, if technical, surgery. And that's all of my slides. <laughs> Chris hasn't appeared. So are there any questions? Thank you very much, Madeline. Um, it's a shame that Chris has been called away to an emergency, so we won't won't have him involved. But if you've got any questions for Madeline, please um, please send them through now. Oh, I think Chris has just joined. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have a question here, uh, Madeline, that says, "Hang on. Any correlation between renal and eye disease?" Um, well, well, yes. I mean, so effectively, that's, um, when, as I was saying, when we look into the eye, we can see that there is vascular disease. So it's like a, you know, it's a window into the um, vascular health of the patient in terms of the diabetic patient. So um, th there isn't like a direct correlation that you could plot on a graph, but certainly. Um, so when we meet a diabetic, and, and one of the things we ask them is, have they had any other diabetic complications? and patients who have had renal issues are more likely to also have um, uh, eye disease, basically, or retinopathy also. Um, hi, Chris. Uh, welcome. Hi, how are you? I'm We're sorry just taking... I was caught up. We, we had an emergency, so my deepest okay. and most sincere apologies. Uh, we've just uh, had a quick... I was starting some questions, so you might be able to join in with those. Um, hmm. Rosalie has asked, can you please talk more about the role of Aviston injections? Yeah, sure. So um, Avastin is an injection that's placed directly into the eye, into the back of the eye, uh, into the vitreous, which is the, the jelly that sits at the back. It's used for a number of conditions. Uh, wet macular degeneration is one. And in the context of this webinar, uh, diabetic changes at the macula. So uh, the, there are a number of injections which are the same class of drugs, and Avastin is the trade name of one of those, Bevacizumab. Uh, there, are, there are two others, and they're all, they all have the same basic uh, mechanism of action and effectiveness, and, uh, and they're usually prescribed once a month, at least three injections and depending on the response condition, they can be ongoing uh, monthly or two monthly or even up to three monthly injections between the injections. Did you have anything to add, Madeline, in terms of what Avastin is and, and our uses? Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, also, so we use it for the maculopathy. So in the webinar, Chris, we were talking about maculopathy and retinopathy. So now, mm -hmm. so as you said, Avastin is one of three. Um, and 
anti-VEGF drugs in Australia, but we use it not only for the maculopathy to try and dry up that fluid at the centre and restore like a normal contour and architecture, which um, is associated with a return to better vision, um, but we also use it for the retinopathy type. So when people have the proliferative eye disease, we know that anti-VEGF anti injections also um, can treat that. But there are big studies in the States that show, so in the, in the olden days, we just had laser as an option as a treatment for that. Uh, we actually could just use these injections alone, but the reality is um, that the treatment is invasive um, and is re you're required to have monthly injections for a long time if you use them solely for that. So I think you and I, Chris, both do a similar thing, is that we use a combination of, of laser and of acid injections uh, in treating proliferative disease. Um, and, and, and as you said, we tend to do monthly injections to start with with the Vastin or the other ones, um, so the Centus or Alia, uh, and then try and extend the patient out. So at, at least with diabetic eye disease, the injections are not for life, um, which is, I think, is an important thing to say to the patients too, because some indications, for instance, the wet age-related macular degeneration is very difficult to stop. Um, the injections uh, in, in that the disease will recur. But often with diabetes, you can have a, a year or 18 months of injections and you may then be able to stop injecting, particularly if, the, if we've been able to get their diabetic control improved. Don't you think? Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. If anyone has any further questions and would like to type them in the chat box, We'll give you another minute. I don't know if you um, can see this, um, but Rosalie has commented that she's delighted to see and hear from the famous Dr. Chris. Thank you for such a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry I'm late. <laughs> okay, is there any, um, any particular slides that you wanted to go back to, Madeline, that um, Chris might have some further to elaborate on? Um, so, um, so I, I, I think we probably covered most of it. Was it? We, we spoke. I spoke quite a lot about diabetes. I may have glossed over slightly over the trachoma slides a bit more because I was, because I was. Um, I think you were planning to speak. Was there anything in particular that you wanted to talk about with trachoma, Chris? I, I mean, I'm sure you did a wonderful job, Madeline, um, and I, I wouldn't want to repeat what you've already said. It, it's essentially about the the WHO guidelines, the safe guidelines. Uh, trachoma is a disease of social disadvantage and being one of the healthiest, uh, sorry, one of the wealthiest nations in the world, uh, it, is, it is not a good situation to be in to still have trachoma existing in our Indigenous communities. It's a, it's a, an, a whole response that's required so to treat the acute disease, uh, treat the long-term disease uh, in terms of the eyelids with surgery, but then also address the the housing issues that that go along with that, and uh, I think it uh, it's been said many times, but it is an embarrassment that developing nations have been able to eradicate it, um, but we haven't yet. Uh, the the strength basis though is that we are getting ever closer to eradicating trachoma as a problem in this country, but it it is a it is a, an illness of social disadvantage. And, uh, and Hollows and a number of other organisations are working very, very hard to eradicate it, which we will get to at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, the Keep Sight program, Madeline. Could you give us a little bit more information about that? Sure. So, um, so the Keep Sight program was uh, actually the brainchild of the Centre for Eye Reach. Centre for Eye Research Australia in Melbourne, and they have, they have a number of stakeholders, uh, including support from the pharmaceutical industry. But the the idea of it really is to for it to become a national screening program for diabetes. Um, but the any anyone who's involved in eye health that performs diabetic screening can register. So you can just Google Keep Sight, and you can register as a provider. Um, and then your patients will be reminded. So uh, in addition to any remind systems that your own practice or hospital um, have, uh, so if the patient should, for instance, leave the area or change address, or they, they will continue to be prompted to return for screening uh, visits, which I think is really huge um, and could be a game changer for Australia because we, have, because we do have a mobile population uh, across such a 
big geographic area, um, implementing a screening program is much harder than in the UK, where you have got one health system over a tiny little country. Um, and so I think it gives us hope that we may improve our uh, stats on uh, reversible blindness from, from diabetes. So please register if, if so. It includes um, health workers, optometrists, anyone who's administering screening can register as a provider. They obviously have to talk to your patient and make sure that they give consent to be included in the program. Um, and there's information on the website on KeepSight um, as to uh, which you can, it's a patient information which you can give to your patients uh, and also for you to read about what it entails. Okay, um, and one further question we had was, um, it's around eye health in remote uh, centres where there is a lot of pull on Aboriginal health workers to be delivering acute care. Uh, how can eye health be prioritised? So both Madeline and I have done a lot of work in rural or remote and outreach. And in fact, we're both Thread Hollows fellows based in, in Alice Springs. And, and we saw a lot of uh, in the, the smaller, very isolated communities, health workers who uh, who were responsible for a lot of the triage and, and initial assessment of patients. Um, the question as to, uh, but so it, it, did the question come from a health worker? I'm sorry, I'm not sure who it came from. It's or, an in-house question, in -house, house question and it's, um, yeah, about Aboriginal health workers and, and their um, ability to prioritise eye health when there's such a pull to other areas of health that are quite acute. Yeah, okay. Um, so a, a number of issues come up. I, I guess the first is that there are some, that there are variable training modules depending on the jurisdiction uh, that the individual works in uh, is the first point. So there are varying levels uh, of access to knowledge. Uh, the second point is that the Hollows Foundation, uh, through their country plan, is working to 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 reinforce the the Indigenous health worker workforce, particularly in the area of ophthalmology, uh, that is out there. A part of that strategy going forwards is about enhancing knowledge and enhancing uh, the ability to triage. And, and have a better idea around acute uh, issues as opposed to, you know, sort of emergencies as opposed to something that can see the next review or, or visit. Third part is that wherever the individual is, uh, there is a, a public hospital base that will have an ophthalmology opinion available. So, for example, in Central Australia, where Madeline and I work, that's uh, Alice Springs Hospital, and there's always either an ophthalmologist or a, a training fellow or registrar available for opinion. And what they'll want to hear is they'll want to know what's happened to the patient, what's the basic history, and if we can get an idea around a vision. So to do a visual acuity is a really, really useful thing. Uh, but there's always an opinion available at the end of the phone. If the individual can get those, those few basic pieces of information, that's an enormous help to the person taking the call. So people aren't out there on their own. Um, but if they are able to do a vision and get a, a reasonable idea around, you know, is this trauma or, or does the patient, have they been known to the service before, what's the degree of vision loss, those pieces of information are critical for the person at the other end to help them make a decision. And don't forget op optometrists as well that they, they you know, they're often, um, there may be optometry support as well, particularly in, in rural and remote areas, and and, um, and optometrists that work in those areas tend to be highly skilled, uh, and also um, will be able to escalate on top more just if, if, if required. So to, you know, collaborate, I suppose, so, you know, make, make, make some friends in the optometry <laughs> sphere. Okay. Um, so we've got another question come through from Sharon. Uh, is an OCT the only equipment that can be used to detect diabetes macular oedema? Definitively, yes. I mean, you can see it clinically on examination and you can get a sense of it being there on a photograph. Uh, but for instance, to, to for when, we, when we diagnose it, we use an OCT and to access um, PBS funded medication for its treatment, uh, we are required to submit an OCT showing that there's edema there. Um, so ideally, yes, 
Um, and so a patient that has reduced vision um, should, uh, with diabetes should have an OCT as part of their assessment. To, to add to that as well, um, we can not only pick it up on the OCT but then subsequent OCTs, it gives us the measurement and that helps us determine the effectiveness of the treatment. So is the thickness getting worse, staying the same or reducing? That's so it gives point. us an objective measurement. Okay, Sharon says thank you. <laughs> so I think um, we might have to wrap it up there. Um, I'd like to offer Chris and Madeline a huge thank you for sharing their time with us today uh, and extend thanks also again to the Fred Hollows Foundation for helping to make this webinar possible. Uh, thank you all for being part of our Health Infonet webinar and please check out our, our new research resources for eye screening and care that are available. Um, I'm just going to pull up the links now for you. That's it. Yeah. And if you've got any further feedback, please feel free to contact myself or Avina. And we've also got the contact details up there for Madeline and Chris. Thanks very okay. much for having us on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Madeline. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks, Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.